like we can't hear you. I think your microphone is not turned on. Okay, perfect. Stop on silent. Ah, yes, indeed. Thank you very much for the introduction, Islam. Uh, so the first lesson already of how to prepare and deliver online lessons, you've already picked up one of the tips is if people can't hear you, they'll tell you. Um, so um, kind of there's no there's no need to specifically say, can you all hear me? OK, because if they can't, they'll tell you they'll start writing like mad into the chat field or someone will actually say, I can't hear you or they will kind of go like this or something like that. Uh, to let you know that they can't hear you. So I'm just going to assume you can all hear me and go ahead. I'm Mike. Uh, nice to meet you all virtually. Thanks a lot for coming along on uh, this Tuesday evening uh, to uh, listen and learn about how to prepare and deliver online lessons. Um, as Islam mentioned, uh, this session is being recorded. Um, um, so in that sense, for various uh, German GDPR regulations and things like that, I cannot name you if you actually mention anything in the chat field. So I'll say hi, because I can see people saying hi, um, but I can't necessarily say hi, whoever you are, uh, just in case you're wondering why he's not mentioning my name. Um, because as we know from being teachers and trainers, um, the sweetest sound in the world to anyone is the sound of their own name being said to them by another person. Uh, so when you are delivering online lessons, uh, do use your students' names because they'll enjoy hearing it. Um, so how to prepare and deliver online lessons. Before we dive into this, I'd love to just get a quick intro to you and learn a little bit about uh, your teaching context easiest way that we can do that is I have prepared a little poll for you, which I will drag into the screen now. Hopefully you can see that. And if you can, could you please start clicking what you've started doing? Where do you teach? Now, it might be that it's in more than one place. Um, and so in that case, I'd say tick the box of the place that you are most involved with. Um, so there's a number of people from a Volkshochschule context here. Um, how many do we have? Okay, so the numbers are picking up. I'll show you. I'll show you the numbers there while people are still completing them. So we can see about about half of us or so um, are uh, coming from a Volkshochschule context, um, and then. Similar enough amount from the other places. So in Volkshochschule, um, yeah, I'm assuming uh, a couple of months ago, uh, your lessons came to uh, a pause in a face-to-face -face environment and you may have had to take your lessons online uh, or maybe they just got paused altogether. Um, but you are thinking, well, what's going to happen now in September, for example, uh, when the semester is due to restart again? Uh, I'm not quite sure of the context there. Are you going to be able to do your lessons face to face again? Are they going to be uh, online? Are they going to be some kind of a blended approach? Um, and so let me just jump that out of the way for now. Um, in terms of preparing and delivering lessons, I mean, I suppose as we as we all know, in terms of being teachers, uh, teachers and trainers. Um, the key is in the preparation, you know, if you if you do really good and solid preparation and you feel comfortable with your content, then the, 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 the delivery uh, will kind of come naturally after that uh, and should flow. And that maybe just be it's maybe more for the for the for the teacher about being reactive to any changes that might happen throughout the lesson. But the key in a lot of this is going to be preparation. So what I will uh, do this evening with you is thinking about, okay, preparing online lessons and delivering them. For the purpose of online, the interpretation that I'm taking from this is synchronous online teaching. So what we call live online. So you're in a, a live room, not unlike this, or it could be Zoom or Microsoft Teams or 
one of loads of other different platforms, but basically being live online. Now, online teaching does also refer to uh, asynchronous learning, so where it's not live online, but online like maybe using Moodle or some other platform or something like that. Many of the ideas I'll give you today can be applicable to asynchronous teaching, uh, but I'm kind of doing this from the perspective of live online teaching. Um, but again, it's in the preparation, it's in the delivery of content, it's in getting the learners to learn autonomously and things like that. And these are all things that you can do in a, in a Moodle environment or a platform-based environment that isn't live either. But we're going to think a little bit about the current online context, as I've already started to touch on it. Um, and I can see people in the chat field are saying that, um, yeah, they have been running online classrooms, but maybe only a few people have turned up. Um, so thinking a little bit about that online context, then we're going to look at, well, some of the key factors in preparing, effective delivery, and then troubleshooting. What do we do when things go wrong? Because things can go wrong. Uh, things often do go wrong in a, in, a, in a technical environment when you're reliant on Wi-Fi and other things like that and computers uh, and stuff like that. So um, in terms of, yeah, our current teaching context, um, how many of you... Actually, let me see if we can do this. Yeah. So, how many of you are currently uh, teaching an online live lesson or have taught an online live lesson? So, what I'd like you to do is to um, write me or yes into the chat field. Okay, loads of people in there. Okay, a couple of no, not yet. But loads of me's. Okay, okay, good. So, uh, so you've, you know, you've, there's loads of experience here in the room is kind of what I'm getting at. So if anyone has any ideas based on what I'm saying, anything they can add to it, additional ideas, suggestions, comments, or uh, questions, maybe a different way of doing something, please do write it into the chat field. The rest of you keep an eye on that and me at the same time. I'll do my best to do that too. Those of you who haven't done it yet, hopefully by the end of this uh, this webinar, you will feel a bit more comfortable to give it a go. Um, this is actually the first webinar of a series of four. So the next four Tuesdays at exactly this time, I'm going to be speaking about a different element of online teaching. I'll tell you more about that when we come to the end. Um, but let's go with another, another quick question for you. Uh, So here is a question that was said. I'm not going to tell you yet who said it or when they said it. But online learning is not the next big thing. It's the now big thing. What year was that said in, do you think? Okay, okay, so we've got, now oh, we've got about 70 responses, most of them are there. I'll give you a look at the answers, or well, not so much the answer, but your responses. Uh, yeah, it kind of would feel or seem logical to think about it being around about 2009, you know, Amazon and, and Google and all of those, had, you know, had kind of been around for at least 10 years, Facebook was about five years old at that stage. Uh, the first iPhone came out two years before that. So it would seem kind of a good guess to go for 2009. Actually, it was said in 1999 uh, by someone called Donna J. Abernathy, who was the editor of a training and development magazine in 1999. So that was said in the context of the whole dot-com bubble and the internet really taking its next step and all these massive online companies appearing everywhere. So it's interesting that, you know, online learning has been around for, well, it's been around for a long time in the context of when computers first came online. Um, but in, in the context of, you know, sessions like these and things like that, it has been around for quite a while, but many of us have been thrown into it, um, you know, 
without little warning or with little warning uh, only in the last kind of three, four months. So, so that's kind of the context for a lot of, uh, a lot of us. But the, the good thing is, is that it has been, because it's been around for quite a while, online learning pedagogy is pretty well established. Online learning resources exist and there's loads of them. Um, you know, so this is what I'm going to talk you through as well. Uh, it's not like we're having to reinvent the wheel. It's more a case of, well, look, e-learning, online learning has been around for a while. What is it that's out there that we can learn from um, to help us do what we now need to do? So thinking about our students and our learners, um, if most of you are teaching in Volkshochschule, then I'm going to make an assumption that most of you are teaching adults. Um, and if we think a little bit about, well, how has the workplace changed? Not only in the last couple of months, but you know, in the years before then as well. Is is traditionally we might have seen closed office spaces or or open plan offices. In recent years, there was a bit of a move, maybe more towards um, flexible workspaces. Um, where's my Zyga? There we go. Flexible workspaces as organisations did become a little bit more flexible, but then all of a sudden we're thrown into work from home. Um, so we need to remember that this scenario and situation of, of working from home is likely to be very new for many of our learners and many of our students as well. They're going to be struggling coming to terms with that themselves from a work point of view. So, you know, so don't feel bad if they're a little nervous or hesitant to join an online lesson. They may never have worked online before. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we need to kind of bear that in mind. I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat field as well. This is something about online learning is you got to keep an eye on what you're looking at, the screens, the chat field. Someone's said online pedagogy is established. Can you recommend some literature? Um, yeah, bear with me a little bit. There are, there are a number of books uh, around about online learning and teaching. Uh, if, you, if you do a search for Gavin Dudeney, uh, he has written a load of them. Um, for, for various publishers around online learning and teaching, uh, even does courses on it too. Um, but bear with me and I'll, I'll, I'll grab a book or two from behind me possibly towards uh, later. But if not, I'll put them in the comments uh, somewhere on the, on the YouTube video maybe because this is probably going to go or this is going to be recorded somewhere and, and put online somewhere too. Uh, or yes, please, I can see some of you doing that. Please post your links and resources to each other as well if you have ideas on those. Um, but... Moving on, so we've already thought about how important online training is and that it has been around for, for, for quite a while, but let's think about what's important when it comes to preparing our online lessons. Let's go through this in a bit of a systemic way to give you a bit of a checklist for preparing and then delivering your online lessons. So I want to think about technology with you. It's important to know your technology. It's important to know how it works. Those of you who, who drive a car, uh, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't jump into a truck or a bus, would you? Um, and try and drive that down the road. You know, the, 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 the pedagogy of driving is kind of the same-ish. And maybe you'd feel comfortable jumping into a bus or a truck because you can drive a car. But would you feel comfortable jumping into a plane and trying to fly that because you can drive a car? Maybe not. So, you know, looking at the... Um, the comparisons between different types of technology that you've already work with, worked with. I'm assuming you can all use a computer or a mobile phone. You're here in the session via computer or mobile phone. So it is not a massive leap to, to, to start thinking about the technology involved in, in delivering a live lesson. Thinking about the pedagogy is an interesting one as well, though. How do we keep learners engaged, motivated, focused? How do we deal with large groups? Uh, and then also thinking about our content. Where are we going to get content from if we're used to teaching, you know, from a from a book, for example, you know, a paper book? That's how is this going to help me in, a, in an online teaching environment? Ah, so there you go. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples as well as we go through of uh, some of the books that I've been involved in writing. Tell you a little bit about some of the digital components in those. And even if you don't work with these books, all the ideas that I'm going to give you are going to be valid and useful for you no matter what book you work with, or even if you don't work with books. Um, and if you work with different books from Cornelison, many of them have an online app or a, a so-called Unterricht Manager, 
which can give you loads in, of, of good resources and content for a digital environment too. So thinking about your tech, you want to divide it between the platform that you're using and your own personal setup. Okay, by platform, um, thank you by the way, I've just looked down and someone has thrown in the teaching online book that I was thinking about. I mentioned Gavin Dudeney, uh, he works very closely with Nikki Hockley, so they would be two names to search for with relation to teaching online as well. Um, but coming back to the platform, so this platform is called Adobe Connect, and it has its own set of features and ways of doing things. You can reposition stuff in different places, so we have chosen to put the camera up here, where it is. Um, the chat field is down there. The slides on my screen are over there. But you can move these around in this environment. There are many other environments as well. Um, and each one is a little bit different, whether it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams or GoToMeeting or WebEx or something else. Chances are they're kind of 90% similar with a few different differences that make them unique. So I like to think of them a little bit like mobile phones. You know, if you can use one mobile phone, you can kind of use any mobile phone. You just have to work out the slight differences between this brand and that brand. Or the same with cars. Uh, you know, this is why rental cars are generally easy to, to learn how to drive, because if you can drive one car, you can kind of drive many other types of cars. You just have to learn where the particular buttons and levers are on this particular one. And it's the same with live online uh, classrooms is that they're most, they mostly will have a camera involved, um, a microphone, somewhere to chat, um, somewhere to put slides, and things like that. So there'll be a chat function. There's lots of ways you can use the chat function to engage uh, your learners. You can ask them questions, like I've been doing with you. You can ask them their opinion on something. You could ask them yes, no answers. Um, if there is... Um, you know, uh, a keyword or something like that. You could ask them about a word to put in to put in a word about something. You could use the chat for people to ask you questions or to ask each other questions. Um, nice little feature in the chat as well. At the bottom of this one, you can you're chatting to everyone. Some other uh, tools and platforms allow you to decide who to send the chat message to. So you could you could get your learners for example, to send you a message privately and not everyone else with, for example, an interesting fact about them. And then you read that out for the rest of the group and they have to guess who sent it to you, for example. So there's lots of different ways you can interact on a one-to-one -one level with chat or on a one-to-group level with chat. Um, someone's mentioned Mentimeter down there as well, uh, which is a great tool. It's a very, very good tool. It's a free tool for running surveys on um, someone also mentioned it's a good idea to have a co-moderator. Uh, yes, it, it very much is. It depends on the context that you're teaching in, um, depends on what it is that you're doing. I, I often do corporate training um, as well, you know, larger events for teams, for leaders, things like that. And there, yes, it, it can be very useful to have a technical moderator who's not only there to monitor the chat and inbound questions, but also there to help people with tech issues that they might be having in the background so that you can focus on what it is that you are trying to do or to say. But anyway, so in terms of the tech and the platform, there's the video, there's audio. Uh, a good option is to mute everyone. It really depends on how many are in your class. If you've got 20 people there, then yes, it's a good idea to mute everyone. Otherwise, they'll all be talking at the same time or there'll be a dog in the background for someone, there'll be a car in the background for someone else, it'll be chaos and you won't hear anything. Uh, if it's a group of four, five, or six, I'd argue leave everyone's microphones on and have it more discursive, more focus around, around active communication. Um, with your screens, you've got options for live application sharing, so you can share audio, you can share video, you can upload videos into the background, so if your course books come with audio files or with video files, for example, you can bring those into your virtual learning environment. Uh, the books that I showed you earlier on, the ones I've been involved with, uh, with Cornelson, they all have a, um, an app that come with them. I'll, I'll show you a little sign for it later. But they have all the audio 
and all the videos from the book in the app, which means that the learners can use them, but the teacher can also kind of bring them into the learning environment quite easily. You can use polls, which is like what I've done with you before. Uh, someone has mentioned Mentimeter again. Uh, there is a really good um, tool for using live polls in class, so you could get people to actually, uh, you know, look up the poll on their on their phone and uh, and answer it and get the live results up on your screen if you're if you're screen sharing into the internet. So Mentimeter is one good tool. Kahoot is another good tool. K A H O O T. It's free for educators and teachers as well. Um, and they're good for creating quizzes like vocabulary tests and things like that. Padlet, someone else has just written about, written about as well. So there's loads of different tools out there that you can use polls with. Uh, breakout rooms, not every platform has got breakout rooms, but those that do can be useful. What a breakout room is effectively like, it's another, it's another virtual classroom. So if you want to put people into small groups or into pairs, you can automatically assign them to a breakout room where they go off and do a task for five or 10 minutes, and then they come back into the main room and report back to everybody about what it is that they have done or learned. It could be a case study or a simulation or something like that, a problem to solve. So breakout rooms can be useful in those contexts. Uh, the whiteboard is a really good and useful function um, for taking notes on or for asking the learners to kind of write on with something. Again, my caveat there would be be aware of how many people are in your lesson. If you've got 20 people in the lesson and you ask them to write something on the whiteboard, it's going to be chaos because they'll all just start writing everywhere and over each other and everything. Um, so a good way to uh, kind of bring order into such a situation is maybe not ask them to freely write something, but maybe you could put up a grid uh, like the grid that I have here. The platform, the setup, I could ask you, which ones are you uh, most nervous about when preparing to teach online? Put an X on the side that you're, that you're most concerned about. So then you manage how they interact with the whiteboard by getting them to just put an X or a dot or a line on this side, on that side, up here, down there. You can create grids. The whiteboards are good for putting grids on and getting them to just mark inside the grid what they feel about something rather than just free speech and free typing because then it'll be a little bit of a mess or could be. And other features, what other features do they have that make them a little bit different? And like I said, every platform is a little bit different from the other ones. So some will have more features than others. Some will have really special, unique features. Pretty much every platform has something unique going for it that they try to use to differentiate themselves from other platforms. So uh, I'd say look into whatever that is and see how can you use it or how can you exploit it. Um, in terms of your setup, uh, your camera, here's an interesting one. So most, well not most, all laptops I would say uh, are not tall enough to deliver live online lessons to because the height of the screen puts them lower than your eyesight. So let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm gonna, let me see if I can do this spontaneously. Uh, so basically what I'm doing is I'm taking out all the stuff I've stacked underneath my laptop. And there, now my laptop's on the desk. Now I've got to do that. And now it feels like I'm talking down to you. You know, it doesn't really feel like I'm there with you because I'm lower than you. But let me now prop it back up again. So watch my eye level now. I'm looking straight into my camera. Now watch my eye level. It's much nicer that way, isn't it? So I basically put a whole load of course books underneath my laptop. Um, so it's a good idea, prop it up, get yourself at eye level with people. So that way it, it does feel more inclusive. It feels a little bit more together with them. Um, your lighting, for example, um, I usually sit more like that in this room, but because there's a window just there and you can see my face is being lit by the window, I purposely switch that way. It's not a huge difference, but in case it gets dark, I've got a light over there as well, which I've just turned on. And actually, I think I'll leave it on um, because then I'm a little better lit. So you need to be thinking about that as well. What's the lighting like in your room? Especially if you're gonna start a lesson around about this time of day and the sun is likely to go down halfway through the lesson, make sure you've got a lamp somewhere nearby that you can turn on. Otherwise you start nice and visible and you end in darkness. Um, be aware of what's in the background. Uh, I did give my bookshelf a bit of a tidy 
earlier on. Um, but just try and avoid washing, dirty washing or drying washing or other stuff like that. A plain background usually works well or books or something like that. Um, your clothing, think about what you're wearing and how that will react with the camera. I've gone for plain white today. I'd recommend plain colours or clothing. Uh, same sort of advice that the people who read the news or who do the weather on TV get as well, is that if you are wearing something that is checkered, like a, like a, a, a very distinctive pattern or some kind, do I have, yeah, there we go. There's, here's what I was wearing earlier, which was a checkered shirt, like that. Um, that's not too bad because the check was quite large on it, but if you're wearing something really tight check or really tight lines, they tend to blur and move and buzz on the camera screen. Uh, and that's going to make it difficult for your learners to pay attention to if, if you're wearing something that has quite a strong design on it. So, um, yeah, so be careful with that. Someone's mentioned on Zoom you can choose your own backgrounds as well, which you can if you have an i5 processor, sorry, an i7 processor on your computer. If you've only got an i5, then you can't. So it just kind of, it depends. And different, different tools allow you to do different things. I think Microsoft Teams now lets you to change your background as well because they're trying to catch up with the guys over at Zoom. Your audio, um, I personally prefer to have a headset in like this. You're, you're, you're coming into me, that's what's picking me up there. Um, just because it removes the risk of any echo or feedback on the line or if someone else is speaking and, they, they're, and they're speaking very loudly, your microphone might pick up their voice and it creates a kind of a sound loop. And having a full headset set up kind of minimizes that risk. Uh, although be aware of where your microphone is. I was talking to someone else earlier today and they had it in like that and they had quite a beard. And every time they were talking, it was kind of scratching on the beard a bit. So just be aware of how your sound setup is as well. Um, yeah, the same with the video. I've kind of touched on that a little bit already. Uh, ah, secondary option. So if, you know, no matter how good your Wi-Fi is, you can never be really sure that it won't drop out. Or if, uh, you know, if you're if you're if you're competing with your kids who are homeschooling uh, for the internet and the bandwidth or anything like that, it's always good to have a second option just in case your lesson drop, just in case your internet on your laptop drops out completely and all your learners are left in the room going, "Hey, where are they gone to?" So what I've done is let me pull this around for you here is I've actually signed in on my phone as well into this webinar. Turn down all the sound and the microphone on it. But in the unlikely event that I happen to lose my connection now on this screen here, I will very quickly activate the sound and the camera on my mobile and be able to pick things up as if I was never gone. So it's always useful to have a little secondary option just in case. Um, and a content backup plan as well. So if it's possible to have a files area within your online learning environment, you can also say to your students, look, you know, nobody's perfect and the world isn't perfect. If I happen to drop out in the middle of the lesson, I want you to go and have a look at attachment one and I'll get back in as quickly as I can, for example. Uh, and in attachment one, you have an exercise that's ready to go or something like that. It's always good to have a little bit of a, a backup situation of some kind. So, uh, let me think about pedagogy. Yeah, so basically, so what I've spoken about is know your tech, as in know the platform you're using with, and know your other peripheral setup situation, your microphone, your clothing, your background, and all of that. If you, if you, if you, if you can tick the box on those, it'll give you a lot of confidence going into a lesson, because you, you'll know that you've, you know, you've covered a lot of the, the core things you need to bear in mind before you even start your lesson. But now let's think about pedagogy of an actual live online lesson. It's really important to have regular interaction with your learners. I'm going to ask you how. Uh, where's it gone to? There we go. Here comes a question for you another poll because I'm actively getting you doing something too. How often should you have students actively doing something in an online lesson? Just 
Uh, while you're thinking about that, I am going to grab those two books quickly that I was telling you about. Okay, let's have a quick look at your results. How often you've gone with kind of every three to four or every seven to nine minutes. So yeah, generally, pedagogically speaking, there's been a lot of research done into engagement levels, attention levels. Uh, there are even virtual online classrooms out there that can show the presenter an attention meter. So if people's main window that they have open is their live online lesson, attention is up to 100%. But if they simultaneously open another window, like their emails or something, attention drops down and you get the average of the whole class. So you get to work out, well, how, how, how well am I holding everyone's attention? Um, and so there's been lots of research done into these things. And, 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 and you know, the consensus generally tends to be every three to four minutes is you should be engaging your learners actively in something. Now that something could be a range of things. It could be just a simple yes, no question into the chat field. It could be something that gets them to put their hands up, either in the virtual live environment, or if you have them all on camera, put their hands up like real hands up, you know? Um, so there's lots of different things that you can do um, to maintain their attention. This is a good book, it's called Live Connections by Frederick Vogelberg. You can find it on uh, online. I'm probably not allowed to say different commercial platforms. Um, this, uh, this is the one someone mentioned earlier on, teaching online, uh, Nikki Hockley and uh, Lindsay Clanfield. And this is How to Teach Online by Gavin Dudney and Nikki Hockley as well. So there are, but there are tons and tons of books out there about teaching online. Um, all which have, you know, merits and strong points. Uh, the challenge with, 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 you know, with a lot of these online platforms also is that they, they kind of date and new ones come out all the time. So while the pedagogy hasn't changed that much, the features and the functions that many platforms have, uh, they change all the time. But one pedagogical approach, which is definitely, you know, a good one for a live online environment is flipped learning. And so in that context, what you're doing is, is you're getting the learners to do the so-called heads down learning outside of the lesson, at home, so that the lesson itself can focus on heads up learning. And what I mean by that is, heads down learning is when your head is down and you're learning stuff like grammar and vocabulary and lists of things, or if it's a case study discussion, it's not the discussion the heads down bit is the reading the case study and thinking about your reaction to it or how you might solve a problem or how you might plan a task. All of those things, they can be done at home before the lesson. So that heads up learning is students actively interacting and engaging with you and with each other. So they're talking to each other about their ideas for solving a problem or they are talking to each other about a case study or a simulation or they are presenting results to each other that they have researched in advance. Now, this is all thinking about a communicative approach to teaching, but also, you know, the heads down is their home learning grammar or their home learning vocabulary, so that when they come into the lesson, they can actively practice it. They can use it. So you're not losing valuable opportunities for communication by having heads down learning. So um, that's kind of the concept of, so flipped learning is basically, Traditionally, learning would be about giving input in the classroom and then going home and practicing that when you get home, otherwise known as homework, right? So you're getting the input when you're in the classroom and you're doing the actual practice work at home. Flipped learning flips that on its head. You get the input work in advance. You do the learning in advance and then you come into the classroom to do the practice, the communicative, active discussion, the debating, 
the simulating, the, the case study discussions, the role plays, all of that is the active bit. So, so the, the, the idea behind flipped learning is that it you know, makes more sense to have people doing stuff on their own that they can do on their own and then maximizing the benefit of being with a group of other people to do that stuff when they're in that group. So, yeah, so it's, it's kind of like homework first and then interaction, although, although the word homework is usually associated with revising, repeating, or, or, you know, reviewing something that has already been done. While from a flipped environment, people might not know anything about the subject before they start looking into it. But the point is, is that you give it to them before the lesson, they do it before the lesson, they then come in prepared. Uh, yeah, you could call it preparation. Um, it depends on the depth into which you're going with the tasks and what people actually have to do to prepare for the live lesson. Um, so yeah, so it's about maybe doing grammar. Pedagogy of the live lesson, it's about keeping people actively engaged. Um, like I said, with the chat field, with hands ups, with polling, with breakout rooms, with content that's interesting, you know, Contra content that's relevant for them. If it's not interesting and it's not relevant, how do we hope to hold people's attentions and motivation and get them coming back for more? So it's about active live communication. It's about collaborating, getting people working together, solving problems, um, uh, project-based work, things like that, um, tasks of some kind. So here's an example. Do a role play or a simulation of a situation where you need to present something, either internally or externally. So this is, this is taken from, uh, from this one, um, which is full of simulations, um, but even though they're print-based, if the learners you know, have the books at home, they can still do the work at home. And then they come into the lesson ready to present, ready to pitch their ideas to other people or to you or in, in the classroom, things like that. So pedagogically speaking, it's about intelligently using the fact that they are at home before the live online lesson. And the live online lesson is only happening in a finite period of time. It's your one chance to get people communicating and not just listening. So we want to move away from any, any type of lecture to actually getting people involved. Um, and then thinking about our content, so I've already touched on a few ideas for content. You can adapt your course book. So you can focus on discussions, simulations, yeah, pair work, case studies, listening or watching. So if you've got audio files on the book or video files in the book, you can play those in your live online uh, classroom as well. Um, I mentioned before the, the books that I've been involved with, the ones that I showed you at the beginning, they all come with an app that have all the, all the listening activities and all the videos embedded in the app so everyone has them to learn from at home as well. Um, having a quick look at the is flipped learning, does flipped learning work for beginners as well? Someone mentioned, uh, yeah, very much can. This is, this is one of the other books I've been involved in, uh, Business English for Beginners, which pretty much does what it says on the tin. I have, um, I've, I've put myself in the position as, uh, as being an adult learner beginner uh, of, of two different languages um, because I wanted to see, feel, you know, do I still remember what it's like to be an absolute beginner? Um, and I do think that flipped learning approaches can work with absolute beginners. It just depends on what you give them to do and you can't overwhelm them. The key to keeping people motivated and moving forward is experiences of success. So even at beginner level, you've got to give people micro experiences of success and that will keep them moving forward. Um, so it's about not overloading them um, with things that they might find either too difficult or just simply too much, not too much volume. Uh, so, yeah, so there's the, the, the app is called Page Player. I realize I didn't write that down somewhere, but if you go into your app store, you can find Page Player by Cornelson. And uh, there are loads of different course books that have the Page Player app that have the content associated with those books in the app. And then um, I'll have to have a quick look at mine. Does it... Yeah, there's a code in everything in the front, in the front, in the, inside the front of the book. 
there's a there's a code and there's also instructions on how to how to get the app so all your learners can get it to um, to just help them both learn autonomously but to help you adapt the content from your books you can use content from the internet from the web um, you know the news uh, content relative to your town or village uh, stories about people's companies there's loads of different ways that you can use the internet um, as content maps as well giving directions asking people to tell you about places where they've been um, you know the great thing about doing a live online lesson is everyone's on the internet at the same time so it's quite easy to pull up other websites in the background and then you as the as, as the you know as the teacher you can share your screen your 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 web screen into your virtual teaching environment so they can see what you're searching for and what you're looking for or you can give them the the key so to speak or the, the control over sharing their screen in so there's loads of opportunities for sharing content uh, from the web that's relevant to um, to their lessons or to your lessons uh, yeah using the new web quest a web quest is like a piece of research basically you're searching you're searching for a particular subject or topic but maybe everything that has uh, different elements to do with that so one one I recently uh, was looking into for learners was uh, the Olympics because the Olympics this year were postponed so if you were to do a web quest on the Olympics you could get one group looking into the current or the next Olympics in uh, in Japan and what's going to be special about them what are the new sports that are upcoming um, anything special about the athletes like the world's youngest skateboarder I think 10 or 11 years old I think she's going to be in the Olympics next year um, things like that. You could get a different group looking at the history of the Olympics, maybe even going right back to the, uh, the original Greek Olympics and Mount Olympus and things like that. You could get another group looking at the modern day Olympics since the late 1800s. You could get another group looking at, well, what's the difference between the Winter Olympics and the Summer Olympics? So that's one way that you could get a big class project web quest around one subject, but divide out different bits of research to everybody, then get them all to present it back in the live lesson. Uh, things like that self-generated content from your learners or from your students you know everyone's interested in something people have hobbies they have personal interests um, get them to talk about them get to define something about it get them to peer teach things like that it might be relevant to their work or to their private lives it could be an element to do with whatever logistics or packaging if that's what they work in um, you could do that did you know activity that I told you about earlier on getting them to message you uh, just a quick guessing game about someone in the group. You know, someone writes in, I fly helicopters as a hobby. So you can say, oh, did you know someone here does that? Who do you think it is? And you get them guessing around with each other and things like that. Um, here's a nice one. You can get your learners to tap into their networks as in the people they know, because, you know, everybody knows interesting people. And if it's around a particular subject or topic, you could ask, you could get your learners to ask their friends or people in the network about this particularly interesting topic. Uh, so one thing that I did, uh, this is my friend Andy. He's, uh, he's from Ireland and he takes part in lots of meetings in work. And when I was writing uh, content on meetings for, I think it was this one, the B2 book, um, I was writing tips for good meetings and I thought, well, okay, I take part in lots of meetings, but why not ask someone who really takes part in loads of meetings, give me some tips for good meetings. So I said to my friend Andy, hey Andy, give me some good tips. And he did. And then I was able to not only put them into the book, but bring them into my lessons as well as a discussion point for learners. Um, we, you could do mystery guest, which is a cool one. I've got a friend in Spain who owns a language school. And when everyone kind of went into the, the current lockdown scenarios that we're in now and all their lessons went online, one of the uh, innovative things that he did, or, or interesting things anyway at least, was uh, to set up a schedule inviting mystery guests into live lessons. So I dialed in to a live lesson in Spain and the students interviewed me and they knew nothing about me, but they had to interview me to try and work out where in the world I was. And once they worked that out, I'm in York in the UK, their, their teacher were then able to pull up a map of York live during this lesson, screen share into it, look up images of York. They said, oh, that looks cool. Tell me about that tower. Tell me about the river and the castle. And I could tell them about it. And then they would say, well, tell me what your life was like there. So I could tell them about that. And then they didn't know what my job was. So they kind of had to guess that and work it out through questions as well. So 
mystery guest is a pretty cool activity that you can outsource to your students, for example. Um, so there's loads of different things that you can do for content. I realize I'm still very much in the preparation phase of this webinar and I'm looking at time and it's run away from me completely. So uh, as I said before, preparation really is the key. If you get the preparation right, the delivery should just run with itself. So moving on, uh, let me have a quick look. Yeah, just one other final point, I suppose, about the preparation is that, yeah, you can use online videos and other things as well. If you don't have the content in your own uh, books or resources, you could use videos for the content. Or in this particular case, some of the videos from the books that I've in, been involved in have actually been put onto the Cornelson YouTube channel and they're free for everyone to use whether they, are, um, whether they have the books or not. Here's a particular one that I, I wrote about working in teams. Um, which has already had about 10,000 views on it on, on LinkedIn or on, on YouTube rather, which is pretty cool. But this particular video, it, it looks at workplace team structures and how they've changed and maybe become a little bit more flat over the years, about how teams have become more agile and more autonomous, uh, about international and cross-cultural teams and the challenges of working in those. Also the challenges of working with matrixed structures, uh, people who might have a reporting look, a local reporting line, but also a virtual reporting line. Um, and looking at the global skills that people need to work virtually and also autonomously. Um, dealing with different languages, time zones, cultures, and so on and so forth. And I think one of the reasons this, this particular video is quite popular is because it's many of these challenges that people are actually going through right now, today, this year, the last three or four months, is how do I work virtually in a team maybe from home or maybe with people on a project in other countries or even in the same country as me. So there's loads of kind of ideas in there to use. Um, there's the link on the slide if you want to take a quick photo of it or something like that or just note it down or you just you just search for it under the on the Cornelson um, video channel in YouTube. It's, it's called Working in a Team from Basis for Business, B1. Uh, but on that Cornelson uh, YouTube channel, there are loads and loads of videos there, uh, which will suit you, I think, if you're in a Berufsschule context, Volkshochschule, private language school, university, there's tons of stuff there. So if you're not aware of it, have a look. Um, and there's been, there's been loads that's gone on in the last couple of months as well. So, uh, yeah, so thinking very kind of briefly about delivery, like I said, it's all in the preparation. But thinking about your delivery, uh, one thing you've got to do definitely is keep an eye on time. And I know that time is my nemesis, uh, although this is a webinar, so it's been very much me trying to download everything from here and my experience to you. Uh, I don't do live online lessons like this. I talk as little as possible and I get my students and learners talking as much as possible uh, in that context. So. Um, You've got to keep an eye on time when you are when you're when you're teaching a live online lesson. You've got to plan the content in micro sessions, remembering they're going to get bored every couple of minutes if they're not actively involved in something. If your lesson is 45 minutes or an hour long, plan it in segments of six to eight minutes with maybe two interactions in that before you transition into the next subject or the next topic. So you've got to get regular activity. You've got to manage your transitions from one topic to the next, maybe by giving people a task to do, like I did with you. I gave you a poll earlier on when I jumped and grabbed a book. So you can also use that to help you mentally get ready for your next transition or your next task. Uh, you can have your lesson plan open in another window beside your screen or on a notepad beside you. So that can help you manage your transitions from one thing to the next uh, within your lesson as well and be ready to very calmly skip something. So if you realize you're running short on time and you don't have time for all five activities that you've planned in your lesson, but only four of them, and you realize that already at point three, then why not maybe skip point four calmly and get to the end one? Because you've got you to be able to wrap your lesson around a proper solid conclusion and an ending. There's nothing worse than a lesson, whether it's a face-to-face -face one or a virtual one, that builds up to something the whole lesson, and then you run out of time before you actually get to it. It's better to drop the fourth thing and get the main thing finished um, 
if needs be. So in terms of your delivery, thinking about tasks they can do, I've mentioned a lot of them already, and tools you can use, I've also mentioned a lot of them already, but let's just kind of run through it really quickly. First of all, you want to set the ground rules with your students. So thinking about ground rules, things like, okay, everyone, please turn off your phones. Uh, if possible, try and get into a quiet environment. Um, if we're going to be having the lessons late at night or something like that, make sure you're well lit so we can actually see you and interact with you. Um, if I'm giving you preparation work, please do it because the lesson's going to, you know, it's not going to work or it'll be a lot harder for you and for everyone else if you come unprepared. Um, and so on and so forth. And I think a really good activity in setting the ground rules is to get your learners to set them at the, in the first lesson of a course. Do it as a brainstorming activity. Because if they have co-created the rules, they're more likely to feel a sense of ownership over them and a sense of accountability to living by those rules. So setting the ground rules. Think about different interactivity types in your lessons. Not always the same type. Vary it up a bit. But depending on the platform you have available to you, whether you have breakout rooms or not, you might not be able to do pair work or small group. So then you're going to maybe have to set the pair work and the small group activity as pre-work. You know, you can say to people, okay, before next week, I want the three of you to liaise on this particular subject, learn about that, prepare that, and then come in prepared. So you can still do the pair work in the small groups out of your live lessons if you don't have a breakout room uh, facility in those live lessons. So blending live and asynchronous collaboration, which is exactly what I've just been speaking about. Um, different types of activities I've mentioned already, give them specific tasks to do or specific projects to, to work on. Debating is a good one as well, because uh, you could set people up in teams, so they'll need to prepare that in advance in teams. So this really encourages autonomous learning and also peer-based learning before the live lessons, so that the live lessons can really focus on delivery and communication. So debates are great for that. Case studies, simulations, active participation, all these things I was telling you about. And in terms of tools, what can you actually use in the lesson? Uh, images are great because everyone has them on the phones all the time. I was looking through my phone the other day going, can I find an interesting image of myself? Uh, eating something I'd never eaten before in my life? Yeah, great, I'll throw that one on. That could be a whole lesson around food, around eating, uh, around would you ever, for example, would you ever eat a sheep's head um, if you were visiting someone in Iceland and they said it was traditional and local? And you'd said, yeah, I'd love to eat something traditional and local. So this is then what you get. Um, and it was really interesting. I'd never tried it before in my life. Uh, it tasted a bit sheepy. Um, it was nice. You know, there were parts of it that were unusual for me to taste, parts that were quite nice. Came with a nice, nice sauce. Something I'd never done before. And you could get a whole lesson out of a discussion of things you've never done before. Um, so images are great because everyone everyone has them on their phone and they take them all the time. You know, they're dead easy to bring in. You could assign a task for your learners to go and take some take a photo of something interesting and tell us about it next week. That's a nice little warmer as well. For example, you can do the polls, the whiteboard I've mentioned before. Get people sharing screens. People might not know how to share screens, so you'll also have to do a little bit of work on teaching them how to use the platform as well. Like put your mouse up there, click that thing, and in the drop down window. Choose the thing that says share screen, for example. So this is where knowing your platform will be really important so that you can help talk other people through how to interact and interface with it. Um, and finally, a little bit of troubleshooting. What happens when things don't go according to plan? The number one rule is take a deep breath and chill out. There is likely to be a very reasonable explanation for whatever it is that's going wrong. And you're less likely to solve it if you get stressed. If you stay calm, you're more likely to solve it. And if it's not solvable, you stay calm, you're more likely to just move on from it anyway or deal with it. Um, so a couple of things that might go wrong with the technology. If the sound or the audio drops out, you can always rely on the chat box, for example, if it's one of your students. If it's yours, you've got your backup plan already, which is your other phone that I was telling you about. Um, if they can't see or hear you or your video player, again, you can rely on the chat box. You can uh, rely on your other phone. 
if it's something important like a webinar or something like that and you really do have concerns, you could even pre-record it and direct people to a recording. Or if it's homework you want to give them, you can record it and send them the file or something like that. There's lots of ways you can kind of get around that. Speak into the audio dictation part of your phone and then email it to them afterwards if, that, if that's a way to help with it. If the camera stops or the camera freezes or the audio is breaking up, just try turning it off and turning it on again. If that doesn't work, exit the whole room and rejoin again. Uh, and if that doesn't work, maybe just leave the camera off altogether. It uses more bandwidth. Um, so if you switch it off altogether, your microphone quality should improve then. Um, so yeah, if you lose internet connectivity completely, that's what you've got the mobile phone backup for. So don't have that on the Wi-Fi of the same house or the same building. Because if your Wi-Fi goes down, you'll then lose them both. I've got my phone here not on the Wi-Fi, but on its 4G connection, just in case the other one goes down. Um, and if you can't remember how to do something on the technology, then just take a deep breath and move on from it. Earlier on, I was looking for the, for the Zeiger, this thing, and I forgot momentarily where it was because my interface right now that I'm looking at is in German. Um, so I had to try and remember <laughs> what's Zeiger of Deutsch. And to be honest, if I couldn't find it, I was just going to move on anyway. And then you would have never known. And I wouldn't have gotten stressed. So, uh, yeah, just don't, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, you're doing a great job and everyone knows that anyway. So don't worry if things drop out. Uh, so if stuff goes wrong with your lesson, if people seem disengaged or multitasking, engage them. That might seem like a really simple and easy solution. But, yeah, think about it yourself. When do you get bored with things? When do you start opening other windows and emails as if stuff is less relevant for you, less useful for you, or you don't see the benefit in it for yourself? So with the content you're giving to your learners, always think to yourselves, is this relevant for me? Is it useful for me? How interesting is this? Um, and if you can answer those questions for your learners, then ideally they're, they're, they're going to stay engaged. Um, let them have the video on, someone has mentioned down there, because um, they don't get to see their students. Um, again, be aware of that. It's great because it helps build a bit of personal connection if everyone can see themselves. On the other hand, um, you know, not everyone might be in an environment at home where they have a suitable background or they feel comfortable showing their homes or things like that. We even got a message from, from the school the other day saying one of the reasons they don't want kids putting on their cameras when they're having live online lessons is uh, because then they'll all get to see each other's houses and some kids might live in nicer houses than others and things like that. So you do have to be aware and sensitive to people who might not want to put their camera on. You've also got to be aware that it's going to start using up a lot more bandwidth the more cameras that are on. So you want to make sure you've got a good connection. Otherwise, people are going to start having difficulties. Um... Some learners are finished faster than others, and that's a classroom issue as well as a virtual classroom issue. Um, so just like you would do in the classroom, you can maybe have a separate section in your virtual space for people who have finished early to review something or repeat something, or you could give them an additional quick task to go find something out. If you finished early, find out what you can about this particular subject or topic, you know? Um, Students are talking over each other. Again, stick them on mute. Uh, that will help that and just manage the interactions. Give people turns when they're talking to each other. Name them and identify them as who's going next. Because you're going to, just like you'd manage in a classroom, you're going to have to manage who speaks and who gets the microphone in a virtual classroom as well. Um, if no one's talking or only the same learners are talking each time, a little bit like in a real classroom, a face to face classroom as well name people say hey hey bob i haven't heard from you for a while do you want to answer the next question for example or whatever it might be if no one is talking name people specifically um that can get them more involved and more engaged or again it could be that they just feel awkward or insecure about about talking you could get them to chat and interact that way although you know it's a bit of a poor excuse these days because people have been using skype and other platforms for for more than 15 years. So I would like to think that people are comfortable talking in a virtual environment. Um, the last one, background disturbances. 
Uh, again, if you have everyone on mute, you're less likely to hear their background noises. But also for them, for example, they might be disturbed by their own backgrounds if they're just listening from their computers. And that's another reason why I have these things on is because I do live in a, in a, in a full household uh, and sometimes it gets fairly noisy in the background. And so these are noise cancelling headphones. So no matter what's going on out there, I can't hear it. So I can focus on being here with you or hearing my students and my lessons in the classroom. Um, so that kind of brings me to the kind of troubleshooting bit. I'm very mindful of the time. So there's a final recap slide. This literally just talks you through the parts that I've spoken you through. But this, this is what's important to keep in mind when you are preparing and delivering your online lessons. Think about your preparation, your technology, the pedagogy of teaching online, and what content you're going to use. There we go. Think about your delivery. How timed is it going to be? What tasks are you going to get people to do? And what tools are you going to use in the live online learning environment? Or other external tools like bring in photos, uh, things like that, the internet, screen sharing, all that kind of thing. Um, and in terms of troubleshooting, yeah, things might go wrong with your tech. Things might go wrong with your lesson. Um, you know, things might go wrong with your lesson, even if it's a face-to-face -face lesson. So even like in those environments, reflect afterwards on what went wrong and how you might avoid it next time, whether it's to do with the tech or the lesson, and try and improve on it next time. And just like with a face-to-face -face lesson, if the lesson didn't go great, maybe it's because some activities were too long, some were too short, your instructions were too long or too short, or explanations, or too many people speaking at once, or, you know, just like with a face-to-face -face lesson, whatever goes wrong, reflect on it, think about how can I mitigate that for the next time, and then do it. With the tech, if something goes wrong, just stay calm. You'll have a better chance of fixing it if you're calm. And if you can't fix it, just move on in whichever way you can, and then learn how to fix it for the next week, or for the next lesson, so if it happens again, you then know what to do. So that's pretty much what I wanted to run, with, run, run through with you today. I apologize for having kept you a little bit longer. I realize I'm probably the only thing standing between you and your dinner, so apologies for that. Um, I did mention that this is the first of a series of four webinars. So next week at this time, I'm gonna talk about how to motivate and engage your learners in online learning environments. I've touched on you know, quite a number of things and ideas um, today, but in that particular webinar, I'm going to dive a little bit more deeply into what exactly motivation is and engagement is, even from a psychological viewpoint, and how can we make sure that our lessons are as engaging and as motivating as possible. Uh, second webinar, or the third one rather, third one in two weeks, is how do we measure progress in a live online uh, virtual or classroom environment. So I'll give you a number of ideas of things that you can use there. Um, one or two of them we've already seen in the chat field today. Tools like Mentimeter or Kahoot are really good for, for quick questionnaires and quizzes, but there's lots of other ways that you can measure progress too. And then the fourth one is how to keep your learners learning during course-free periods. So what I'm specifically talking about is the end of one course and the beginning of the next course. So let's say you're doing courses at the moment that come to an end around the end of July, and the next ones aren't going to start until September, what can you do to help your learners continue learning in that August down period? So I'm going to give you loads of ideas for that in on the 21st of July. Um, so that's brought me to the end of this session. I hope you found it useful. Uh, I realized the pace was fast. I was trying to just get as much down to you as I could. So uh, if it was a bit fast for you and you'd like to kind of go through it again, the recording will be online in one to two weeks, so you can then grab yourself a coffee and go back through it at your own pace. Um, and other than that, if you've got any questions or comments for me, um, my email address was at the very beginning on the first slide, mike.hogan at convergence.international, uh, or you can find me through my About Me page, which also links through to my Twitter accounts and my LinkedIn account, uh, I share stuff on both of those about teaching and learning and communication skills and stuff like that. So that brings me to the end. I realize I have gone a little over time, so I'll apologize. Thanks a lot for sticking with me. 